Vice President Mike Pence warning North Korea not to test the United strength or President Trump just moments after he visited the DMZ. Joining us now is Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger. He's the Deputy Republican Whip and a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's good to see you, sir. You too, Chris. Thanks. Morning. So, talking tough. Americans like it. Works well, especially domestically. But it is a very different game, as you know all too well, once you go abroad. This apparent brinkmanship. Do you think that's what we're seeing, that the White House is testing the idea of the threat of force to try to change the dynamic in North Korea? I think the White House is doing, in this case, what needs to be done, which is, look, the diplomatic instrument of power <clears throat> is best and most effective when backed up with the military instrument of power. So basically, in an adversarial relationship, if you say to North Korea or to China or to whoever, and you say, we are willing to use military force, and, and I guarantee you we will prevent, we have the ability to prevent you from marrying your existing nuclear missiles or your nuclear warheads to a missile that can reach the United States, we're promising that you won't be able to do that. And we're giving that credible threat. Now let's find diplomacy as a way to do this, as a way to get out of this without military confrontation. I think that's what you're seeing in this administration. And, and it's like when you look at what happened in Syria, the president, President Obama and Secretary Kerry, in a very good heart, wanted to negotiate a solution to Syria. But when all was said and done, they did not back that with a credible threat of force. And so therefore you saw Assad and Russia never compelled to really get to a peaceful negotiation at well, the table. Well, two points, right, Congressman? First, uh, 2013 was very different in 2017 in terms of the American and Congress's appetite for force, right? Obama drew the red line, right? Or pretty clearly crossed in most people's uh, observational notion. And then he goes to Congress. He says, you guys have to weigh in. Congressman didn't want any part of it. The American people didn't want any part of it. So it wasn't as simple as just being weak about it. And we'll see what difference this bombing makes in Syria. But the idea of hey, we want to do this diplomatically, but, you know, U.S. is no joke when it comes to military might. That's always been the position, but this seems to be more aggressive. And is there a risk that comes with that aggression? Uh, well, I think there's always a risk. On Syria, by the way, I was talking about even a year and a half ago when there was an attempt to negotiate a solution. Mm -hmm. And I agree, I think Congress bears some responsibility because you had people like Ted Cruz and Rand Paul out there uh, campaigning against giving the president authorization to bomb in 2013. In North Korea, what you have is a new Donald Trump, a new administration that came in, can start that relationship on a fresh page and say, all right, here's the deal. We know that you are close to get to marrying a nuclear weapon. Keep in mind, they already have nukes. Marrying that to a missile that can reach our allies in the short term and us in the long term, here's the deal. The deal is we're going to do anything we need to militarily to prevent that. Our hope is, through China and through other means, you know that we're serious and we can get to a peaceful solution. Uh, the notion of a preemptive strike, you said earlier on, hey, we have the ability right now to keep you from marrying a nuclear capability with a propellant, with the actual missile. Would you back a preemptory strike? What would you need to hear from the president of the United States to vote yes on something like that? Well, in terms of a preemptive strike, here, to me, the absolute worst case scenario is uh, you know, Korea has a nuclear, North Korea has a nuclear missile they can deliver on any of our allies. Next to the worst is a preemptive strike. So this is the last case scenario, but this is where the administration has to look at the whole thing and say, look, number one, um, do we feel that we are at threat right now of passing the point of no return with North Korea, where there is no option once they do have the ability to put that to an ICBM? And I think up until that point, we need to do everything possible to prevent that. But there is going to be a moment. Again, North Korea is exactly where we fear Iran could get and why there was a whole Iran nuclear deal was to prevent them from getting to this point. So this is dead serious, and this will be up to the experts in the military to say, here's the point at which there is no return beyond it, and hopefully we never get there because that's a next-to-worst-case scenario. And as an interesting shadow dynamic, you remember what the threats of force seemed to do with Iran, right? Made them double down, go deeper into their reserves of where they were going to test and how they were going to test. It was the economic sanctions and that soft power that ultimately uh, created a resolution, resolution in quotes, because many don't think it ended the situation. Let me ask you something about what we're not talking about because of what's going on abroad right now, which is Russia and its geopolitical implications and, of course, its impact on our 
our election. You just had a CODEL meeting, a congressional uh, delegation meeting with your foreign uh, counterparts as part of what we should all be on the same page about. Russia loomed large. What did you hear? So, look, they were uh, all of our allies. I went to, I was in France, Latvia, Poland, and the Netherlands, and all of them were frankly, very happy about the strike in Syria. They said not just because of the Syria issue, it really sent a message to Russia. They were happy with what the Vice President, Secretary Mattis, and folks in the administration have said about NATO, and they feel more comfortable in it. Uh, there's no doubt they were very concerned with some of the early words of the president, uh, but that seems to have shifted lately uh, because he has said, you know, NATO is no longer obsolete. And, uh, and so, look, there is some strong concern. We're having to rebuild infrastructure right now in Eastern Europe as part of the European Reassurance Initiative uh, with troops forward deployed in, in the Baltics. And I saw, by the way, our men and women uh, operate very heroically doing live fire exercises in Latvia, and I got to tell you, we have the best trained military, and I'll tell you, the Russians will think twice before making any incursions into the Baltics because they know uh, what they would face on the other end. And not just another appraisal of the uninitiated. You are a veteran of both the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. Thank you very much for joining us, as always, Congressman.